From the Church Pension Group, this is Choose Well. Hi, my name is Krishna Dalakia, and this is Choose Well, the podcast that focuses on well-being, from maintaining physical and psychological health to being financially secure. Today, we are talking about the role of caring and caregiving and how to regain and maintain our sense of self and well-being as we care for others. Our guest today is Jean Denton. Jean has experienced caregiving in both a professional and personal way. Along with being a priest and a chaplain, she worked for many years as a nurse and deacon working in parish nursing. Her most recent caregiving role was with her husband during his long haul with younger onset dementia. Jean led the three-part Caring for the Caregiver webinar series at CPG and shares her experience in her new book, Walking Each Other Home, Spiritual Companionship for Dementia Caregivers, which is now available on church publishing and Amazon. I'm so excited to have you here on the podcast today and talk a little bit about some of your experience, some of the work that you've done, and also um, your book that is out now, Walking Each Other Home Spiritual Companionship for Dementia Caregivers. So thank you for being here. Well, I want to thank you for having me. It's good talking with you about these important things. Thank you for having me. I wanted to first ask... Uh, this book that you have written that I really love, I'm curious as to what motivated you to write it. Well, I think there are a couple of things. One was the fact that my husband was diagnosed with early onset dementia. And during that whole experience, uh, I was trying to make sense, certainly of what was happening to him, but also wondering what was happening to me. I didn't find out there, you know, in literature or a lot of conversations, support for how I was changing by being a caregiver. So once uh, he died, I decided I was going to take some time and do some looking into myself and um, what was happening inside me and decided that if I found anything worthwhile, I could put it down on paper and maybe it would help somebody else. I had no illusions of um, getting rich as an author. I just feel that I'm a person who has had an experience that's worth sharing with someone who might be able to benefit from it. I think another motivation was I, I just didn't want all that 13 years worth of caring to be for naught you know, to kind of go away and that's done and put a period after it. I wanted to remember that time. I wanted to remember my husband during that time and I kind of consolidate it and see, see, you know, incorporate it into my being. I'll put it that way. I remember you mentioning in previous conversations that you attend, you went to a bookstore, I forget where, and you had asked the assistant there to help you find books on this topic, caring for the caregiver. And can you tell me a little bit more about your experience with that and what you found? Well, I could tell you that it was a wonderful independent bookstore. I was delighted just to be there, but uh, was really taken back. I asked first about, you know, caregiving books Oh, well, he said, I don't know that we have any of those. Well, you might look over there in diseases and see what you find. Um, And then I said, well, how about, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia? Because that's what the kind of caring I was involved in, uh, informally anyway. Well, go look at the at the Alzheimer's section. I didn't find what I wanted. So. Maybe this book has got a little niche somewhere. Yeah, no, and I think that's why it's such a great book, because there's not a lot of books like it. In in your book, you talk about how caring is complicated Mm. and how we use this word as though everyone knows what it means, despite its wide variations. And I am reading this from your book all the way from writing a check for a good cause, to being vigilant of another person, to changing that person's diapers. 
Uh, you also reference Joan Tronto's work where she categorizes caring into phases which include caring about, taking care of, caregiving, and care receiving. I re remember when I got to this point in your book, I had to stop for a moment because I never actually ever think I, I stopped to think about caring this much. I feel like in our society, we don't really unpack this word caring and how it relates in so many different situations and scenarios. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, I think you're right on. Our society, I think, is embarrassed about caring. Uh, that may be an overstatement, but uh, I think there's some truth in it. We like to think that we are giving and we are we are caring, we're, we're loving. Uh, that's fine, but that's not the whole story. I think Tronto's on target here when she says that there are levels of caring, and it's not just the giving part of the caring. Um, she talks about caring about, which is a pretty abstract thing. I think we care about the people in Haiti when we make a donation to Episcopal Relief and Development. We care about cancer and cancer patients by making a donation or volunteering for the Cancer Society. This is good. It's a noble kind of thing. The next level or phase that Tronto talks about is taking care of, and that's kind of taking care of business. When there's a specific need and a specific thing that can be done to fix a situation, somebody steps in and does it. It's the, uh, the big donor, let's say. It's often a male thing, tied up with some money there, and it certainly is lauded by our society. And then Tronto talks about caregiving, wherein she's talking about hands-on care, caring, touching, you know, the, the real here and now. And that's kind of lower on the totem pole. That tends to be women's work often. It is not work that is compensated at a very high rate in our society. It's a hidden thing. It's often done in a home whether that's caring for a child or caring for a parent or someone with dementia. Even in um, a nursing home, they're kind of put away, they're aside, they're not mainstream. So caregiving, that third category, is, is kind of a big one. But then I'm always interested that she ends with care receiving. That's really the bottom of the totem pole, if you would. Uh, our society thinks that people who need to receive care should be pitied. We kind of forget that we've all been cared for sometime. We wouldn't be alive if we hadn't been. And we forget that we are all probably going to need care sometime further in our lives. We, we don't want to talk about that. I think Tronto goes on in her book to say that it's really hard for self-made people to admit the degree to which care has made their lives possible. But such an admission, and this is a quote, such an admission would undermine the legitimacy of the inequitable distribution of power, resources, and privilege of which we are the beneficiaries. Yeah, and the one thing that's coming to me as I listen to you is how complicated all of this is. But on the other end, when I, I look at some of these words or hear you talk about it, I also hear... When I think of caring, I think of love. I think of giving and receiving love, yeah. which maybe is the basis for all of that. I was just thinking of uh, Henri Nouwen is a, a favorite author of mine, and he defines caring in a way that I hadn't thought of it before. Despite my being a professional caregiver, you know, as a nurse or as a pastor or um, informal, taking care of my husband. But his words are um, that caring is being able to cry out with those who are ill or confused, lonely, isolated, and forgotten, and to be present and to stay present even when nothing can be done to change the situation. That's love. That's deep caring. That's beautiful. I used to uh, work at a long-term care facility as a dietitian when I first finished college. And one of the things that struck me the most was in this facility, the, the population that lived there were ranged from children 
to the elderly, to people who had mental illness, to people who had Alzheimer's and or some form of dementia. And yeah. I, whenever their, their loved ones came to visit them, whenever they were leaving, there would be this, I could tell this sense of, of guilt and regret for leaving and for having, having put them there. And I, I always would observe that just feeling or emotion that I would see in them and think that really, in fact, the act of putting someone in, in better hands is a huge show of love. I agree. Uh, I might not have said that before. Uh, my husband needed more care than I could give him at home because that was, that was a pivotal time in my life, the sense that I could not do it anymore. I had hit bottom for me. I did not have the resources within me of time and energy and knowledge and fortitude, etc. I think that when we do, quote, turn over care to somebody else, it's a moment when we as caregivers receive care. That may need a little unpacking. Um, but when I could say to uh, others, would you please take care of Tom because I can't do this now? They're also taking care of me. So here I am now at this bottom of Toronto's little pyramid, maybe, saying, oh, I'm a care receiver. I really don't want to have to receive help. I want to be able to do it. I want to do perfectly on my own. And that doesn't happen. But I think somehow, in our society anyway, we like to think that we are so independent and so capable that we can do that and do it forever. It, it's not possible. I think of you in that uh, nursing facility, I think you saw quite a slice of life, didn't you? A little bit of everything. And uh, I'm interested that you picked up that piece of that bit of guilt that caregivers carry just because they need help just because they're not the Messiah. Yeah, I mean, I think that you don't even have to be a caregiver, right? You just need to love someone. <laughs> you know, I, I sometimes feel guilt that I don't get to be with my mom all the time and check in on her and make sure she's okay because we live a little bit further away from each other. I think that's the, that's the, the gift and sometimes the hard part of loving someone is that there's always going to be this sense that no one can take care of you like I can. And that when you have to give, give up that sense of control, of, of caring and taking care of, it can feel like a loss of control. And I imagine that guilt and regret are not the only two emotions that follow. <clears throat> they certainly are strong. Giving up control, I think it's, it's a matter of hubris, actually, that, that pride that I can manage, that we have to come back to our mere humanity, that we don't have all the things we think we had or wish we had. And, and we're mere mortals. We can do what we can. You talk about caring and loving being so connected. I'm thinking of an ancient hymn, Latin hymn, Ubi Caritas, and in translation, wherever love, caring, caritas is, God is there. And I think there's something about that love and caring being the same thing, and that that being something more than the material world we live in. It's something from the beyond. It, it's God at work. It's the divine. It's the higher power really taking hold. Yeah, they go together, caring and loving. It makes me think of, of my everyday life here in New York City, which is a place where I learn a lot just from walking down the street. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I, think, I think about caring in different ways, right? As, aside from caring for a person, I think about how I'm being cared, cared for every day in the city that I live in. Um, like how the streets are cleaned every other day, how the park is man maintained and beautified for us to walk around and experience that, how, you know, the, the garbage is picked up every day. And, yeah. and it might be those simple things that we don't really consider or acknowledge, but how, how would it be if there was garbage on the streets every day? 
which sometimes it feels like in New York City, but I'm sure it would be a lot worse. But I, I sometimes sit and I think, like, how grateful am I to live in a city where I can actually see how I'm being taken care of? I think what you're saying bespeaks the interdependence of life. The city needs you to do your work, and you need the parts of the city to do their work. If we could only honor each other's caring, I think we as a society would certainly be further ahead. And maybe people would really have a living wage to go with it, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was reading your book, you had written in the book about your experience when you first learned that Tom had dementia or had the diagnosis of dementia or the type of dementia he had. And in your book, you, um, you say dementia is not a solo experience. Shortly after his diagnosis, Tom said, I don't have dementia. We have dementia. He spoke a truth I only learned as I lived into it. How wise was he? And I think that is is so profound because, you know, from the webinar series you hosted or led, some of the comments and the questions that were coming in kind of really spoke to this interconnectedness, interweaving of, uh, you know, it, it's not just me anymore. It's me and my loved one that I'm taking care of. It's, yeah. it's a united effort. It's a we. It's a strange kind of we, but it is a we. We are together in this. It's the same dementia that we're looking at, if you can look at it when it's happening inside your body. Uh, but it's the same dementia, but it's a different experience of that dementia. And you're walking this, this hard path, and you're going to wind up in different places, but it's still a together experience. You know, I, I think how... Uh, when it's a personal relationship that you've got with somebody that you're caring with, caring for, and really caring with, it's it's such an intimate experience that it's the caring doesn't have the same uh, overtone maybe as caring in a nursing home. Let's say, it's wait a minute, this person with whom I'm walking is somebody I have known, I have known deeply, I have known intimately over years maybe. And all that that person was hasn't gone away. It's in some mystical way still all there so that the caring takes on a different dimension, maybe more emotional attachment. I'm not sure how you want to describe it, but it's, it's a different level of caring, a different depth of caring maybe. Is it fair to say that sometimes we can lose ourselves in the caring? I certainly think so. It's uh, it's as though you, the two become one, as opposed to two individuals walking together. It's it's a, a fine line sometimes. It's um, difficult to make that distinction to find some boundary between two intertwined lives, and I think it's important to notice that. My, well, me, again, my experience, Tom's dementia, experience with dementia was different from my experience with dementia, even though it was the same dementia. To, to acknowledge the differentness and the choosing to be together rather than we're so wrapped up in each other we can't do anything else. That whole idea of boundaries is, is so important. I think boundaries need to be set and I wish there were a softer word than boundary, but some um, acknowledgement of the the otherness of the one we're with, um, that I'm not that person and that person's not me. Um, I think that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, when we blend totally, we can lose ourselves. And I don't think our loved one would want that. I don't think the good Lord above would want that. Uh, I think we're created as individuals to care for each other, love each other, support each other, but not try to become each other. Boundaries matter. I'm wondering if you could give an example of, from your own experience, of when perhaps you realized that 
you were losing yourself? Like, what were some of the symptoms in that you experienced of overgiving or, or caring for someone without caring for yourself? Like, what would one experience in such a situation? Maybe everybody experiences it a little bit differently, but uh, you take me back to an image uh, of when I knew I had hit rock bottom. Um, I had mm -hmm. been working in a church. It was the end of the Christmas um, hoopla ha, you know, the Christmas mm -hmm. services, and it was the week after. It was actually the January 1st, I guess. It was our anniversary, our wedding anniversary. And I was exhausted, and I was tired of shoveling snow, and I was tired of happy, happy. And um, I, I lost it. I, I wept. I was in a separate room from Tom, but I, and I tried to muffle my sounds. I didn't want him to know that I had hit bottom. But I did. It I was exhausted physically. I was depressed. Uh, I I was functioning, but I think when you function uh, in that situation, you kind of are going through the motions. You're, I've had this thing, I would call it compassion fatigue. I was tired of doing this much caring. I needed some space for me, and it was feeling like selfishness if I wanted to take that time. I don't think it was selfishness. I don't think anybody who gives caring is a selfish human being. But I think that that self-care thing gets mm, confused with selfishness in some minds, and mine was one of those minds. You use the word compassion fatigue, which I believe is very common in professions where caregiving is at the front and center, like people working in healthcare, hospice, clergy, um, yeah social yeah. workers. Compassion fatigue is something that I believe um, is experienced a lot in these professions. Mm -hmm. And I think but compassion fatigue can lead to burnout. And I think that what you say about creating boundaries is so important. And I think professionals have a, an edge there because there are certain boundaries that are uh, imposed. Uh, you have a certain shift, and then you've got to walk away from that work. You've got a job description that says you can do X, Y, and Z, but you can't do A, B, and Q. You know, there's some some parameters set around what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. And informal caregivers, it's just do what's in front of you to do. Use your best judgment. Do what needs and to get done. And do it all the time. Do it all, and do it 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You're on call. Even if you're not physically active 24 hours a day, you're the responsible party, period. You talked earlier on about asking for help. How hard is it to ask for help when you're caring for, some, from, for others? And how, how can it, it change the relationship of care when you do ask for help and that help is given on a regular basis? I think it can be life-giving mm -hmm. uh, when that care that help, you know, that, again, that's kind of receiving some care when one can do that as a caregiver. I think it's very hard in our society, again, I, I blame some nebulous thing called society, with creating this image of independence and self-reliance and just I'm capable and put my mind to it and I can do anything. That's a lot of hogwash. <laughs> we can't do it all. We cannot. Mm -hmm. If we can kind of let some of that stuff go and see for what it's worth, <laughs> to see it for what it is in terms of a certain level of hubris, again, that, mm -hmm. that pride. Can we let that go? Can we recognize our mere humanity here and say that we have limits? Oh, we... It's not weakness no. when you ask for help. No, it's it strength. is not weakness. It takes guts to ask for help. In, again, in this society, it's, you can't, you're not independent and you've got to face into that when you're asking for help. And it's awfully hard to ask for help. I think there's a fear sometimes when we ask for help that someone else is going to step up to the plate and not do as good a job as we think we could do. And we want the best for our loved one. 
and we think we can do it best. Again, that's that hubris thing coming in. I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded when my husband needed more care than I could give him, we were talking with the doctor in charge of the care facility he would be moving in, Tom would be moving into. And this doc looked me straight in the eye and said, they'll give good care here, Jean. It won't be as good as you want to be able to give him at home, but it will be good enough. And that mm. business of good enough uh, is something we need to hold on to, I think, uh, as a life, <laughs> to, to keep our lives on track. Good enough is good enough. There is no perfect. Good enough is good enough. And we should put that, uh, put that on a label and, and stick it all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good Put on point. your car as a bumper sticker. <laughs> I'm driving good enough. <laughs> well, maybe with the driving, you want to drive really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think that what you're talking about is this perfectionist quality that we all bring with many things in our lives, with work, with um, caring, which becomes work with um, taking care of ourselves, which I see a lot as a dietitian, you know, eating, the act of eating restrictively to, to look a certain way, uh, to, to be of a certain, to be quote unquote healthy, um, ex mm -hmm. over exercising, you know, yeah. I think that the, this perfectionism in, in its own way can be unhealthy. Perfectionism can lead to burnout. And what would it be like to just do good enough? And what would you gain from doing good enough? When I do good enough, I have more time for myself. When I do good enough, I have more compassion for myself. When I do good enough, I understand failure is a part of success. When I do good enough, there's more space for me to breathe. Absolutely. And I, I think when we say I, I, it was good enough, we gain a certain humility. And again, I think that's what makes us um, of the earth, humus. We're just, we're doing the best we can. And it is good enough. There is no perfect. I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about clergy, because that is one profession that not, not, isn't necessarily just limited to work hours, right? For most clergy, they consider being clergy a vocation. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I hear from clergy that they're taking work home, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, when you talk about boundaries and setting boundaries, this kind of work can be hard to do that. And burnout and compassion fatigue isn't a new thing um, in this population. I think that we've been seeing this a lot more during the pandemic, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this um, uh, compassion fatigue and burnout within the clergy population. I think it happens if we think as clergy that we're the Messiah, that we're the one who's going to fix it, that we can walk into any situation, any um, crazy congregational dynamics or family dynamics, and somehow we think we can make it better. That's pride. That's, that gets in the way of um, just honestly being giving what we can give, saying what we can say and referring on situations or acknowledging that maybe... In the congregation, we didn't cause this problem, and we don't have the solution to it. Boundary setting for clergy is as important as for anybody else. I'm remembering uh, years ago in the diocese I was working in, there was a, a clergy who said, I won't do weddings on Saturday. That's my day off because I can be with my children. Well, that was appalling to some people. Of course, weddings happen on Saturdays. and uh, But he, he kept his boundary there. He said, that's my day with my children. 
I think it cost him some in terms of status, shall I say, or uh, um, image, you know, in in the larger clergy community, uh, maybe in the congregation too. But it was clear. He had his values. He knew he needed to be fed and being with his children and helping them grow into who all they could be was his priority. He was actually walking the walk, not just talking the talk. He was doing it and, it, and it cost him some. What would it be like if there was a movement, I guess, to, to prioritize, prioritize your day off, to prioritize self-care, to prioritize compassion and care for yourself first? Put your own oxygen on first. Taking care of oneself in order to care for others. Why do we think we can care for others if we can't even care for ourselves? You know, I also see the other end of this, which is sometimes it's hard to face yourself. Sometimes it's hard to sit with yourself. If you're so <laughs> used to, if you're so used to being the point person and being, being the beacon for for everyone else, you might it might be it it might lead to a disconnection with yourself. Yeah. You, you let yourself or put yourself on some kind of a pedestal as an other. Uh, and it's uh, that disconnect from one's real person leads down some very bad, to some very bad places, very bad places. Mm -hmm. We wind up seeking solace where we shouldn't, uh, where it, it isn't real, it's not substantive. Um, we really get out of touch. And if we're out of touch with ourselves, I think we get out of touch with the world that we say we're caring for. I say this because I think it's important to have compassion for the fact that this is hard. Yes. You know, we say these words self-care and self-compassion and sit with yourself but that might not be easy, and the acknowledgement that it's not easy. But once once you start to build a connection with yourself, it starts to lead to other connections that you might have lost with your community. So in your book, there's a chapter that you label encounters along the way, which I really liked. Uh, and you talk here about some of the states of beings, feelings, and emotions that you may encounter in the caregiving journey. Um, for example, things like ang anger, anxiety, acceptance, blame, depression, doubt, emptiness, forgiveness, grief, guilt, helplessness, hope, intimacy, loneliness, resentment, and thankfulness. And I, and I decided to read all of it because I, I think it's important to name these, these companions or encounters. And I, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how they appeared in your journey and, and how you were able to hold space for them or manage them. That is such a good question. You know, how do you hold space for these things? Because you, you've got this myriad of, you know, their feelings, emotions, reactions, responses that you think can't fit together. You know, how can you feel angry about the situation one minute, maybe, or simultaneously with accepting this is the situation? How do you put together, I feel so helpless, there is nothing I can do, at the same time knowing that what you're doing is making life possible for this one that you're caring for? Uh, things that, that shouldn't fit together but do meet together. I think it's important to have conversations between those things that seem to be so different. Um, there's a whole, you know, set of thinking about uh, the overlap of opposites. Um, I mm. won't go into the specifics, but you know, the mandorla is an, a medieval image where you've got two worlds that should be separate, but they 
overlap and you wind up with this space. Mandorla means almond. So it's an almond shaped space that's like, wait, is this both worlds together? An overlap that way? Or is this something brand new? Is this a, a sacred space, a newness? Medieval art, you get uh, the incarnation. You get God, the numinous, becoming mortal becoming human in the incarnation. And you'll see in pictures this almond shape aura of, wow, holiness, because things that can't fit together do fit together, and new things come from that. I think there's an awful lot of feeling we have uh, as caregivers that, if you want to put it, you know, in a dualistic way, are negative. Blame, depression, resentment, it's all there. I think it's important to remember that they all need to be welcomed. All these feelings, uh, just because they exist, just because they're real, need to be welcomed as teachers, as I've got to learn something from this. Um, I think in the past, uh, Krishna, we've talked about this poem that Rumi wrote. I think it starts, this being human is a guest house, and every morning there's a new arrival a joy, a depression, a meanness. He goes on, you know, whatever it is that's coming to us, we need to say, oh, hello, here you are at my door. I wasn't expecting you, but come on in, we're going to have tea. Sometimes we embrace what comes to us, and other times we would like to pretend we're not even home. But <laughs> unless we open that door, uh, we're going to foreshorten our growth which again is is not it's not easy to open the door um <laughs> well, especially uh, when we think we can have compassion not... for that you know yes. oh this is not easy i have compassion for that so this is the both and Absolutely. of holding both at the same time it's that business of turning toward whatever comes right you mm -hmm. know instead of turning away and trusting that, that life is a gift, all of it is the gift. And it's not a matter of good, bad. It's just a matter of isness. This is what's happening. How can I engage what is happening? In the past, we've talked about, and I also uh, read in your book, you talk a lot about mindfulness. And one of the examples you used in the webinar series is how you were observing something in a moment that maybe some would say was unpleasant uh, about mm -hmm. the moment that you noticed the urine on your husband's pants and yeah. how you noticed it was changing colors. And yeah. that was a moment for you to be mindful of. And it wasn't necessarily a pleasant moment, but you found something interesting about it. Well, I think when we take ourselves out of the moment, the here, the now, and put ourselves thinking about the past or the future. The past, oh, it wasn't supposed to, you know, this never happened before, I wish this weren't happening, it's not supposed to be, or into the future. Am I going to have to do this forever? Is this what's ahead of me to do? Will these tasks never stop? You know, if we can get rid of some of that stuff and say, oh, right here, right now, can I observe, can I use my senses, can I be present to this task? And it may be, as you say, a pretty unpleasant task, but if we can have a curiosity about it, as well mm -hmm. as a compassion for ourselves in doing the task, I think we come out ahead. Mindfulness, by definition, is paying attention to the present moment without, yeah. without judgment. Yeah. The key thing, key word, is without judgment, which could be a whole different podcast topic without judgment, right? Because I think that we bring a lot of judgment in our everyday activities and everything that we do. And maybe a mindfulness activity is to observe whenever judgment is coming in. And yeah. just notice, oh, I observe it, not necessarily that it's bad or good, but how is it, how is it coloring the moment right now? Yeah. yeah, and how is it keeping me from being in the moment right now mm -hmm. and seeing what some uh, other ways of perceiving might be? So 
mindfulness um, is something you talk about in your book in terms of some spiritual practices to engage in as a, as someone who is a caregiver that you can do to take care of yourself in the moment. And you say it in a way where you say these practices are not one more thing to add to your to-do list. They, they These practices are a part of your everyday life. And I really like the way that you, you say that, the to-do list. When mm-hmm. we start to put self-care practices or pra- spiritual practices in the to-do list, it becomes a burden, not a place that I go to to reconnect to myself. Yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, how, how broadly do you define spiritual practices? Um, I was brought up in a tradition where uh, it was expected that the spiritual practice was sitting quietly for 20 minutes, first thing in the morning, reading scripture and praying. That's great if it's working for you. But I I needed to have that expanded, that that could be part of it, but that, that there were so many other spiritual practices that... Uh, I can engage in, I can um, get nourishment from. Uh, you know, it can be gardening for pity's sake. I love gardening. And why? Because my hands get dirty. I am connected with something that's just that earthy, you know. And uh, it, it makes me aware of seasons of life and the uh, fragility of life when things get cold or things get too drop stricken or... Um, it, it it teaches me if I can really look. Maybe it's all under that umbrella of mindfulness, but you know, paying attention to where you are, when you are, where you are. Yeah. In your book, you break down these spiritual practices into categories: while giving care, at home, with others, and when alone. Mm-hmm. Can you care? Can you share some practices that would fall into these categories? I think uh, you know, at home, just looking at our environment. Um, I think creating some space, uh, and it doesn't have to be an altar in the corner of your house, though it could be. It could be um, copies of classic art if that interests you. It could be family pictures. It could be pictures of happier days. Um, it could be the music that you're playing, um, but to create an environment just in in your living space that can get you out of and and noticing <laughs> some of this art or some of these photos that are around, not just passing them by, but engaging with them. Um, I think are examples maybe of you know how just being uh, at home and having space that nourishes your soul make a difference. Certainly, you know, while you're giving care, there are ways of noticing what's going on. Maybe it's doing a body scan, noticing what's happening in your face, just paying attention to that. Oh, I feel that tension in my cheeks. What's happening in my neck? What's happening in my shoulders? Noticing gives me the opportunity to say, oh, do I want to keep that or do I want to let it go? To notice how much our bodies are um, means of connecting with something beyond the physical. Yeah, and and just to give a resource to our audience listening in, we have a recorded body scan that Dr. Jeffrey Zahn had recorded in our mindfulness episodes in series one. So if you've never done a body scan, he does a really great job going through that. And, and maybe the more you practice the body scan, the more easily you can move into it so that when a situation is somewhat tense, you go there more automatically than um, having to think about it and take time to decide to do it. You just do it. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah. In one of your, in your book, you talk about spiritual practices with others and you talk about sharing sharing your experience can actually lessen your burden a support group does that Uh, you talk about support groups specifically in in this situation 
the Alzheimer's Association. Um, you talk about the, the support groups that they offer around the country. Regardless of, of the situation you are caregiving in, there most likely is a support group out there that can, that can help, whether it's virtual or in person. And I think this, um, this suggestion of sharing, you know, unloading your experiences, finding support can be ex extremely crucial in how we take care of ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. And it can be as formal as a support group. Uh, I was in a clergy support group uh, that was gold for me. These were not people, um, I, I, I started out not knowing them very well at all, but we hired uh, somebody who was a therapist to facilitate our sharing just knowing that other people knew the path that we were on and we could kind of do some shorthand talking at times and we could feel heard and understood. I think support is an incredibly important way of getting through and I think that's a spiritual practice. What I would add to that is that sometimes it doesn't have to be that formal. Um, I Again, my experience as uh, a dementia caregiver at home, for me to invite my neighbor or a friend in for a cup of coffee was uh, a way of connecting uh, with the wider world because your world can get so small when all you're doing is focusing on your own caregiving and the one who is receiving that. Um, I know some people say, oh, but the house isn't clean, or oh, I don't know what I would serve. You know, I'd say, put that aside. That's nice. If you want to do a seven-course dinner for somebody sometime, that's, that's great, but that's a different story. I'm talking about just having hot water and a tea bag and mm -hmm. uh, getting out of your own gerbil cage thinking so that you can be engaged in something a little bit bigger and therefore have something better to offer the one you're caring for. Be in relationship is what I hear you saying with others. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be fancy. It's great if it's a deep, long-term, established relationship. I think that's there's nothing like that. But if you don't even have that, something a little lighter, just getting out of your own small world, because all of our worlds get small, and find out that just over a cup of coffee, how much broader your perspective can become, because you've heard somebody else's story. It doesn't have to be fancy, is what I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. through, through the medical trust plan, um, we have Cigna Employee Assistance Program, which is such a great benefit that mm -hmm. offers behavioral health um, assistance for for anyone enrolled in the plan and anyone that is a household member mm -hmm. or a household living in the household of the member um, so this gives you an opportunity to use their 24 7 behavioral health hotline and work with a therapist or work with one therapist for over the course of 10 visits. Yeah. And um, I think therapy therapy can be so important if you are caregiving to to just to, to be a place where you can you can be highlighted as a person receiving care. I think I could not have survived caregiving without my spiritual director and my counselor. Um, the perspective you gain from having been heard deeply is gold. It's precious. There's nothing, nothing like it. And I think it's a real um, wisdom on the part of um, church pension group to have that as a benefit, that you really do have access to this. Mm-hmm. As, as we wrap up this podcast, I really wanted to focus the last minutes here talking about some suggestions that you may have specifically for caring for the caregiver, some, some techniques, some self-care tips that 
that someone can focus on when they're looking to uh, start or change their perspective on what it means to take to care for themselves. When I was having great difficulty caring for myself, my sister said to me, Jean, write down 10 things that you like other people to do for you. Just write them down. Yeah, gee. I was surprised. I love receiving flowers. I loved receiving somebody's used New York Times on Sunday. They had finished reading it, and now I get it. That kind of caring. She said, now, Jean, figure out how you can do that for yourself. So I think it's important to find out what nourishes us. We have to be in touch with ourselves enough to know what matters to us and what uh, self-compassion really would look like, self-care. How do I want to be cared for? I think it's going to be different for each person, but we need to know what it is that we want in terms of caring. Um, is it time alone? Is it time uh, being going out for dinner with somebody? Is it uh, finding that spiritual director who can really respond to our situation? Is it journaling? Is it having a really nice book that I can just write my thoughts in and find that maybe God can talk to me through some of that stuff? Is it gardening? Is it um, finding some meaningful work or hobby that's different from the norm so that I can explore a different part of who I am. I think self-care is unique. It's not the same thing, one person to another. It's not a, um, a checklist uh, other than what you write is your own checklist and what you need and then going about loving yourself enough to get those things. Um, again, it's not selfishness. It is uh, a very healthy kind of self-love. I think that uh, too many of us have glommed on to love your neighbor as yourself and translated that to be love your neighbor instead of yourself. No. Know how you need to be loved and go about doing that, and then you've got the resources to give the care to another that that other deserves. They don't need a shell version of, of care. They need the whole thing, and you can't give it unless you've got it. I couldn't agree more. I think that's a really great place to start. I will also add that gratitude practice is a really powerful practice to engage in, especially if, if things are really hard right now in this moment or it's hard to see the positive in your life, just writing three or four things that you're grateful for every day and they don't need to be big things. It might be that you, you, know, you got to see the sky today. You got to see someone smile at you on the street. You got to spend time with someone that made you feel better. Um, it can change change the way we're looking at the situation and focus on the things that we are grateful for in our lives. Absolutely. You make me think of a quote from Meister Eckert, if the only prayer you ever pray is thank you, it is enough. Gratitude takes us far. I'll also add, since we've talked so much about mindfulness, that there are programs out there um, mindfulness for the caregiver or um, mindfulness-based stress reduction programs for caregivers. And I, I would just do a Google search on that and see what pops up. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, I think that, you know, um, the, the first and foremost is to stop, pause, and acknowledge all the good work that you're doing and, and start to build a relationship back with yourself. Offer yourself some self-compassion. I think another, maybe another piece of this is while we're doing that, notice what we are gaining out of being caregivers. You know, mm. I think we, we learn something in this process. There's a benefit to the caregiving. It's not just all taxing. 
And sometimes we forget why we got into this business, maybe, or why we committed ourselves to caring for somebody. But we develop um, an honesty, I think, in this. Uh, we we uh, are we become more courageous. We become more responsible. Um, we just plain grow in this process. We're doing it because we're getting something good out of it too. But don't overlook. Uh, the growth that's happening in our own souls and spirits. Well, this has been so wonderful, Jean. Thank you so much for offering your wisdom. Well, thank you again. It's an honor to talk with you, and I, I mean that from the, my, the bottom of my heart. I really mean it. <laughs> that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Theme music for our podcast is by Fran McKendry. Be sure to visit the e-learning library and learning center on cpg.org for wellness resources. And please join us again for Choose Well. The views and opinions expressed by guests of Choose Well are their own and do not represent the views and opinions of the Church Pension Fund or its affiliates, collectively the Church Pension Group. Neither the Church Pension Fund nor any of its affiliates, collectively CPG, is responsible for the content, performance, or security of any website referenced herein that is outside the www.cpg.org domain or that is not otherwise associated with a CPG entity. You've been listening to Choose Well from the Church Pension Group 